Hey ladies, I wanted to jump on and make a video today and honestly this is a difficult video for me to record. So this is not normally what I post about, but I, after really just praying for about a week about this, I really decided that I wanted to share some thoughts about the Rachel and Dave Hollis divorce announcement. So I know that there's going to be a lot of different opinions on this, and I'm sure that I'm going to get some comments about, well, you shouldn't judge, and all those are based on a verse in Matthew 7, 1 that says, don't judge or you'll be judged. And so that verse is really... Um, can I just say it's really misunderstood and really misrepresented. And so I'm going to leave a couple of links in the description about that are linked to videos that pastors and Bible teachers have taught on this verse. So if you're really struggling with that and you're thinking, well, the Bible says I never should judge anyone, I want you to know that that's not true. And those videos are going to show exactly why that ver you know they're taking that verse in context and really telling you what that means. And so maybe in the future I'll make a video about that, but just to give you some biblical teaching on that, I'm going to leave those links in the description for you. Now, the reason why I kept coming back to making this video is because of a verse later in that chapter. So in the same chapter, Mark chapter 7, it's verses 15 and 16, and Jesus says that whenever you're seeing false teachers, that they come like a wolf in sheep's clothing, and that you're going to know who they are by their fruits. And so basically Jesus is saying, look, there's going to be false teachers among you and the way that you're going to be able to tell is by looking at their fruits and lining up what they say to the word of God. And so that's what I'm hoping to do in this video. I want you to know that my heart is to teach and really help those Christian women who are struggling right now with this announcement. So I have seen tons of comments on both Dave and Rachel's announcements on Instagram and women who are saying, you know, if, if your marriage can't survive, then there's no hope for my marriage. Or there was even one woman who said that she was thinking about calling off her wedding because of this announcement. And that's the reason why I decided ultimately to make this video because I want you to see some of the dangers in Rachel's teaching and what we're going to do is I'm I don't know her personally so I'm not going to pretend to but what I am going to do is look at her fruits so this video is not going to be like conspiracy theories or my opinions but it's going to be we're going to look at what she has said either in direct quotes from her book or direct videos that she and Dave have made. And I'm not even going to use social media posts in this because I know that, you know, large influencers have social media teams. And so I'm not even going to list any kind of social media references in here. So we're just going to look at her fruits, the words of her book, the words that they're speaking out in their videos. And then we're going to line them up with what God's word says and figure out what how, what we can really take away from this announcement and from Rachel's books and teachings in general. The first concern that I have with Rachel, and maybe this video wouldn't even be created if she didn't brand herself first and foremost as a Christian. So she speaks in her books about God. She talks about being a Christian. She shares verses. And her first book was actually published by a Christian imprint. And so this was geared towards Christian women. I know many women's ministries that were using this book as a devotion in their classes. And that just makes me cringe because there are several things in her books and that really make me believe that she isn't really following what the Bible says. And one quote in particular, and I'm going to read this word for word. She said in her book, um, Girl, Wash Your Face, she said, just because you believe it doesn't mean it's true for everyone. Faith is one of the most abused instances of this. We decide that our religion is right. Therefore, every other religion must be wrong. And women, that is absolutely wrong teaching. Let's look at what God's word says. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no room for misunderstanding in there. Jesus says, I am the only truth. I am the only way. You can't get to heaven. You can't get to the Father through anyone else, any other religion, except through me. That's what God's word says. Now, let's jump into 
her advice about marriage. Now, I am going to be referencing a video that she and Dave made on their YouTube channel called Five Tips to Improve Your Marriage. And the five tips that she gave to improve a marriage, now remember, mostly her her audience is Christian women, but her tips were do your Enneagram, make a date like a date night, commit to great sex, hire a cleaning person, and go back to the beginning, basically go back to the beginning of your relationship. Now, whenever I look at all those things, they might be good tips. You know, knowing your husband's personality is helpful. Having that one-on-one -on -one time and date nights is helpful. Certainly, sex is an important part of marriage, you know. But some of the things like hiring a cleaning person, um, those, those things, they might be helpful, but... Whenever you have a platform and women are looking to you, Christian women are looking to you to improve their marriages, why don't we grab information from the guidebook, God's Word, where in 1 Corinthians 16, 14, it says, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Or Ephesians 5, 25 says, love your wife, it's talking to spouses, love your wife the way that Christ loved the church. Another one is James 5.16 that says, pray for one another. That praying for your husband is a huge tip to improving your marriage. And I'm sad that it wasn't part of that video. Uh, Philippians 2, 3, and 4 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others as better than yourselves. Or even Ephesians 4.15 that says, speak the truth in love. All these things are words from God's word, from the Bible, that can help improve your marriage. Whenever you start praying for your husband, whenever you speak the truth in love to him, whenever you are living in an atmosphere and an attitude of humility, that's going to improve your marriage much more than hiring a cleaning lady. And ultimately, I want to say that marriage is really about an imperfect man and an imperfect woman coming together who love each other in Christ's strength to do more for God together than they could do apart. Really, marriage is a picture to the world of who God is. And so whenever we go into marriage that way and we start to realize that if we have the attitude of Christ in our marriage, that's what's really going to improve our marriages. The last thing that I wanted to share about Rachel and some issues that I have with her teaching is that her Everything that she teaches, everything that she shares is all about a works-based gospel. That's the underlying theme. So I'm going to read some quotes to you from her book. And it's Girl, Wash Your Face is the book that I'm going to read from. And the first is, you are meant to be the hero of your own story. Another quote that she gave said, you and only you are ultimately responsible for who you become and how happy you are. And the third one that I wanted to share today is know this one great truth. These are words from her book. Know this one great truth. You are in control of your own life. Where does God fit in in all of her teaching? There's no room for his divine providence. There's no room for his control over your life and the control really that you should surrender to him whenever you follow him, right? There's no room for that. There's no room for him taking you on this learning lesson and maturing you and sanctifying you in Christ Jesus. I don't know about you, but when I read that quote about being the hero of your own story, that is not empowering to me. I don't want to be the hero of my own story. I want God to be the hero of my story. He already is. I want him to be the author and the perfecter of my faith. I want everything that I do to be a reflection of him. And that means that whenever I admit that I can't do anything without him. That actually means that his grace can flow more into my life. We've heard that verse where Paul says that his grace is sufficient and that whenever it's in our weaknesses, that he is made strong. So it's in your weaknesses, in the things that you can't do, that God is able to shine his light and his glory more in your life. And I remember that even the breath in our lungs comes from him. We can't do anything without him. I led a worship team for many years. And one of the things that I would always pray before we went on stage was, Lord, let them not even remember who is on stage. Let them just remember that we pointed them to you because without the Lord, we're nothing. Without the Lord, 
we can't do anything. And so whenever we come to that place of humility, that's when God can really move in our hearts. Another quote that I wanted to share from her book, Girl, Wash Your Face, Wash Your Face, was your life is supposed to be a journey from one unique place to another. It's not supposed to be a merry-go-round that brings you back to the same spot over and over. And I really want to encourage you, you're my sisters in Christ, I want you to know that your life is more than a journey. Your life is more than something that you can, you know, how much you can accomplish or how much money you can make or having a body that is like Beyonce or whatever your goals are. Your life is so much more than that. You exist because God wanted you. And your life, ultimately as a Christian, should be a reflection to the world of who God is. Remember, we're supposed to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto us. And the truth is, if God wants to take us back to the same place over and over, like he did with the Israelites in the wilderness, he will do it. If he wants to take us back to those places, and as he's maturing us and growing us in his image, he'll do it. And so ultimately, we're not in control of our lives. There are things that we can do to be more productive in our day, sure, or things that we can do to have a better, you know, have better systems in our homes or do better at work. Those are all helpful. But at the end of the day, he's ultimately in control of everything. There's a couple more quotes that I want to share with you. And the next is, if you really want something, you'll find a way. When you don't really want something, you'll find an excuse. And so these kind of quotes are what really tells me that Rachel is speaking heavily on the value of works. And we, if you've seen any, if you've read the book or you've seen any videos about Rachel, you'll know that one of the biggest things that she talks about in her book is that if there's an example she gives, if a friend says they're on a diet and then they get off the diet, that you shouldn't respect them. And that just that right there is based on works. Another quote that she gives is that hope is not a strategy. And I can I can appreciate what she was trying to say there. She was trying to say that there is a value in action. And I definitely agree with that. But I'm reminded of Isaiah 40, 31, where the Bible says those who place their hope in the Lord will renew their strength. And so whenever we take things like that. Hope is not a strategy. What we're saying is it depends all on me. And the problem with the works gospel is that when something happens, maybe like a divorce in her case, what are you left with? Now you're the hero, right? You're supposed to be in control. And so it's now up to you to fix it. It's now up to you to make it work correctly. And There's no room for grace in a works-based gospel. Another quote that she gives says, never break a promise to yourself. I think another part in the book, she says, what if you just decided not to break promises that you made to yourself? And the problem with that is we're fallen people. Everyone in this earth has broken a promise to themselves. And what about the oath that God gave, that, you know, that we give before God whenever we enter into marriage? A works-based gospel has no room for error. It has no room for fallen people. But there's good news, and that is that God's gospel of grace does. The gospel, the true words of God, give room for fallen people to come back and to be restored by someone who's greater than they are by the Lord and really just experience what grace is versus trying to do everything on our own. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have all broken promises to ourselves. We all mess up. And the beauty of the gospel is that that means we need a Savior and He is here for us. Even the title of her second book, Girl Stop Apologizing, really gave me cause for concern because I, just thinking about the Christian life, your Christian life begins when you apologize, right? Whenever we repent and say, I have done something wrong. I need a savior. I need saving. And so whenever we come into this this attitude of girl you know, stop apologizing. What we're saying is I'm in control. I don't have to listen to anyone else. I have it all figured out. And what happens whenever we mess up? What happens when we have to give a divorce announcement or, you know, something happens and we are not capable of dealing with it on our own? I don't know about you, but I need the Lord. 
I am not my own hero. I am not the determining factor in my life. Everything has to flow through him. And so I really hope that this video isn't just bashing Rachel. That's not my goal. My goal is not to do that. What my goal is, is to help women, especially Christian women who feel maybe betrayed by her teachings, or they feel like they don't know where to go next from here. Or if I can't trust her, what Christian teachers can I trust? I want you to know that there's a way to respond to her announcement. And it's not in the way that Rachel teaches. God has a different way of viewing things. He has a gospel of grace. And so if you're really struggling with this, I want to encourage you to pray and ask the Lord if maybe you've placed Rachel on a pedestal in your life, maybe as an idol, that really that pedestal should only be reserved for Christ. And maybe you've gone to her teachings or her books more than you have to God's word. And I want you to repent of that, but then also realize that she's a fallen person too. And so because she's fallen, it doesn't mean that everything in God's word is not true. It doesn't mean that your marriage can't thrive. It just means that she's a fallen person also. And that's why it's so important that everything we learn, that we line it up with a measurement against God's word. So just because someone claims to be a Christian or they are a Christian, I would even hope everything in my videos that people don't just take at face value, but they go and look up the verses that I share and they look up the teachings that I'm giving because I'm a fallen person too, right? I need grace too. And so anytime you're reading a devotion or you're, re you're listening to a pastor or you're listening to you know a podcast, make sure that you're lining it up with God's word first and seeing if it measures up because that's the way that we can maybe take the good things that are out of this and maybe just let go of the rest. Because what I'm seeing is a lot of women who maybe they're not as strong and founded in God's word. They don't have that foundation. And so they're looking at popular books like Girl, Wash Your Face or like Girl, Stop Apologizing. And they're thinking that that's what God's word says because the speaker says that they're a Christian or they're kind of throwing out verses back and forth. But I want you to get comfortable in God's word. Really start spending time there and paying attention to what you're learning and lining it up with God's word. That is definitely what I teach the women in my Thrive Bible Study Vault is just to take God's word and line it up with everything that you're seeing, everything you're hearing, and even your own thoughts, right? We have to take God's word and really make it the standard for what we think, what we listen to, what we read, and then decide, does this pass the test or does it not? I hope that you guys like this video. I will talk to you guys again soon. Thank you for being here and watching, and I'll see you later.